and welcome back to my bookshelf tour where uh we're getting we're a bit of a like a kind of a storage place for all my fantasy fantasy novels and what i have here is a big whack o tolkien's Ugh, it's hard to do this with one hand maybe i should have my thing but yeah that's my reading copies of tolkien so they're you know they're the cool cool non-movie tie-in ones that uh I saw earlier as I peer in between in between the stuff so you know every color you want as long as you want black with uh, that it doesn't have the similarity similar similar in <laughs> yeah in there but uh, it's got all the more kind of reedy really reading ones that uh, I can do versus that uh, my un my original Unwin Allen one which I you know I will probably hold on and just cherish as as little keepsakes of my uh, of my young teen years. Uh, I will, I'll just probably always hold on to those. Um, next Gigantor series I have is Game of Thrones, which I got on the Game of Thrones bandwagon just slightly before they actually did the. Uh, the, they actually started on HBO because I listened to uh, Geeks On, uh, an old podcast, which I think is now in abeyance, where um, a bunch of self-described geeks uh, got together and discussed stuff. And for some reason, uh, probably through connect connections, uh, they got a they scored an interview with George R. R. Martin and talked to him about this series and about him being, you know, a gardener who. You know, he doesn't, he didn't plan this out. He was just like, he, he just drops seeds and he waters them. And then, you know, he, he kind of prunes as he goes along and, um, didn't think about the time of like how long it was going to take him to do that, to do that series. So yes, Game of Thrones, which the, cause it, it had been out a while. Cause I, you know, I, even, even then when I, when I started, um, this series started it was first published when a 1996 is when the first when game of thrones itself was published and then i didn't i i so i have all these uh i have i have all these oh, i don't even know which which order they're in i found all these kind of good good mass paperbacks with all the ye olde covers which uh then got then got discarded and i think then they went to that kind of the feast of crows kind of like that that was the next bestseller thing and then just the latest one which is ooh, uh dance of dragons uh in in that thing and uh i think at this point i won't i will i will i've i've read them i won't reread them until uh he finishes he finishes the series or uh, the series is finished one way or the other. Um, I've also got a couple of, I do have a couple of his just sort of, um, well, there's wild cards, which is, uh, him as him as editor, uh, of a, uh, kind of created universe, which they get various, various authors to write in Edward Bryant, Leanne C. Harper, Stephen Lee, George R. R. Martin himself, Victor Milan, John J. Miller, Lewis Schreiner, Melinda M. Snodgrass, who is one of the names I actually recognize, Howard Waldrop, Walter John Williams, and Roger Zelaney, uh, sort of his 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 old buds from when he was uh, more of a uh, short story, and kind of he wrote he wrote novels like you know Song of Shadow and Song of Stars and Shadows. A feast of legends to savor, some with a shudder, some with a smile. Deadly spiders big as pumpkins consume victims who scream with joy. A saga of a man who lives alone on his own planet. Adrian Connor, master probe, uh, takes on a client who claims to be the subject of a tel telepathic torment. An all-too-possible revolution in the United States post-1984. How Jupiter got its 13th moon. And other astounding tales, including And Seven Times Never Kill a Man, nominated for the Hugo Award. Um, George R. R. Martin has the voice of a poet and a mind like a steel trap, which uh, is definitely uh, definitely a good way to describe uh, George R. R. Um, and yes, here, let's just quickly 
go down and we can finish off these bits down here. Uh, some Howard, Howard Moss, Instant Lives, uh, illustrations by, by, um, Edgar Gorey, which is probably why I got it. It's, you know, it's, it's got little, little, little illustrations with, uh, lives in it. Um, Aldous Huxley, there's the illustration of Aldous Huxley there saying, um, Penelope left a mark on St. Gaudens that might accurately be described as a scar. Derision, coldness, the absolute disdain of second year goddess, the speckled, the speckled or vampire, made not the slightest, made not the slightest. Under her hands, a mediocre hockey team became a dazzling instrument of personal power, the coffee club. All. Oh God, it goes on. All Kensington starch when she arrived vibrated with Brazilian protein at, at the end. One could almost smell the beans. She was energy incarnate. It was all the more amazing in view of her appearance. Not a clue. She looked actually as if she were about to be ravished by an interior decorator. The shoe was on the other foot. And what the what fresh girl had ever before fallen desperately in love with the most famous taxidermist of his time. How many mornings had she dawdled in the front of his shop, D Della, her best friend in tow? There Tony was, clear as a picture, ravishing as one, standing at work in his window, never a nod for them. Had he fallen merely for the window dressing? Or should one, in this case, say, stuffing? That he did his extraordinary work in Barnesnable on Weir instead of London only added to his inaccessibility. So yes, Instant Lives by Howard Moss with uh, with the illustrations by Edward Edward Gorey, and then I have uh, ah, randomly Malcolm Lowry under the volcano, um, a book that I bought a long time ago. Uh, Malcolm Lowry actually hung out in the Lower Mainland in Vancouver uh, and drank a lot, but I mean that's not special. He drank a lot everywhere. Uh, this under the volcano is uh, under the volcano. It is the day of death, and a fiesta is in full swing in the shadow of Pocapatibedi. Ragged children beg coins to buy skulls made of chocolate, and an ugly pria dogs ugly pria dogs roam the streets. Jeff Jeffrey Furman, H. M. ex consul, is drowning himself in liquor and mescal while his ex-wife and, and half-brother look on, powerless to help him. As the day wears on, it becomes apparent that Geoffrey must die. It is, on, it is his only escape from a world he cannot understand. So yeah, I've always meant to actually just sort of pick that up. I think that it's about alcoholism. It uh, gets me a little bit just because of my father uh, and his, his uh, uh, ultimately fatal tussles with alcohol is probably one of the reasons I haven't picked it up, but it's always here for me if I, if I want to just, uh, you know, there's always a bit of fascination with the alcoholic and when they can put together enough sentences to, uh, maybe communicate, communicate some of that to the outside world. Uh, I've got Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, the wizard of Ursi, the first in her, her, uh, the young, young, young wizard books. Um, a lot of people consider it pretty dry in its writing. I don't know if I found that myself. Um, she does have a certain sensibility, though, that is anatomizing. Um, and she's also working in a kind of a, in a mock, in a mock, that fantasy register of kind of high fantasy in a way. So her language can feel a bit on the stiff side, at least in that book. Um, and the Toms of Atuan, which I think is the is a, yeah is another is is the other one of the other books in the Earth Sea trilogy. This lovely trio of novels, recognized classic of high fancy, fantasy, has been compared with Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and C.S. Lewis's Narnia series. The present volume, The Toms of Atuan, is a sequel to A Wizard of Earth Sea and is followed by The Far the Shore. Well, that's kind of a beautiful cover there. Yeah. Uh, Ah, got a Guy Gavril K that I have collected and have not read, uh, Under Heaven, which I think is sort of, yeah, so Guy Gavril K has tendency to take history and reimagine it slightly, 
uh, into a fantasy setting. I mean, George R. R. Martin does that in a way with um, with uh, his Game of Thrones series being kind of the War of the Roses, but he adds a lot more, probably a lot more fantasy into it than I think that Guy Gavriel Kay has tended to do. He started, Guy Gavriel Kay started out very, um, very kind of just kind of regular, just straight ahead kind of derivative fantasy, but he kind of carved a path for himself away from that. Uh, um, and with, with, considerable writing skills, um, kind of beauty in his language that kind of set, sets him apart. Uh, this one, I believe, is uh, got to do with sort of uh, being about under heaven, is about kind of, uh, ch I think, Chinese. Um, Each night for two years, Shen Tai has listened to the ghosts of the dead soldiers in the darkness outside his isolated cabin. In honor of his recently deceased father, a celebrated general who led the Imperial Army in battle here, Tai has devoted himself to the solitary task of burning the bones left lying by the mountain lake. But as Tai prepares for his return to a brilliant, dangerous court, he receives news of an extraordinary gift, a gift that could change the empire or end his life. Uh, yes, in Under Heaven, Guy Cavroquet tells a story of honor, power, treachery, and love in a setting that evokes the dazzling Tang dynasty of 8th century China. And yeah, that, 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 that idea of evoking it um, but not being necessarily complete, utterly wed to it, but uh, not, not, not to the point that he's taking off the, the, he's, he's, he, he doesn't let down the, the net of, uh, uh, a, uh, historical novelist, but neither does he completely find himself wed to it as well. So yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting book that I should, I should get to. I've really liked, liked his, uh, uh, novel series set in the Byzantine Empire. Actually, I probably may have mentioned that earlier in my thing, the Serentine uh, duology, Serentine Serentine duology. Um, here are some. Here is a couple of books, a uh, little set by Greg Bear, uh, the Infinite Infinity Infinity Concerto, and uh, the Serpent Mage, which I believe are one and two of that of the series. There is a song you dare not sing a melody that you dare not play, a concerto that you dare not hear. It is called a song of power. It is a gateway to another world, a gate that will lock behind you as you pass, bearing you for, barring you from the earth forever. When the song calls to you, you must resist, for it is a world of great danger as well as of beauty, and it is not good to be human in the realm of the, of the, of the city. So yeah, I think it's a it's kind of fairy, fairy, fairy world, and a guy who gets involved in that. I think a musician. I think a musician. It's been forever since I actually read these books, but um, God, you can tell how forever it is because there is, there is the color of the inside page, which I think started out white, and is rapidly turning yellow. This was published in. 1984, and I have a feeling it's probably an original, original printing of it that I've I've held I've held on to. Uh, if a man could pass through paradise in a dream and have a flower presented to him as a pledge that his soul had really been there, and if he found that flower in his hand when he awoke, I, what then, Samuel Taylor Coleridge? Yeah, yeah, Michael Perrin twitched in his sleep. So yeah, I, I have, I have, it's one of these books. I remember nothing from it, but I, I, I have strong, I have a strong feeling of affection for it. You know, that's the thing you, you read books and sometimes the only thing you remember is just how, how it enchanted you at the time. And I don't know if I read it now that it would, would hold that power over me or not. I guess I, I'm, I'm reluctant to, because I just, I, I love that feeling when I look at the books. I've, I've, I've held on to them all this time and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that is, that is my bookshelf at the, at the moment. Yeah. That's, that's my bookshelves. I'll be back with, uh, some, some, some shelves that I hold, I hold, I hold in common with Jaja and, uh, then I'll probably do, ugh, probably do an investigation of my uh, rather sleazy comic book collection, which is rather sleazy. Um, but yeah, what the heck? I'll probably have a look through that and 
we can discuss we can discuss my uh, adolescent uh, sexuality as expressed through comic books, and sometimes just my love of art as well, and love of good story and adventure as well. It's in there as well, but there's also a lot of adolescence in there, I think. Or adolescence or just arrested sexuality? I don't know. I don't know. Something like that. We'll 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 get to that when we we'll jump off that bridge when we get to it. Uh next, hopefully it'll be yeah, the common bookshelf out, out, out outside my office here. More videos later.